Hey, welcome back. Uh, I'm grateful that you have chosen to be with us for our online assembly. Um, there's a lot of choices that you could have made. And, and we want you to know profoundly that we're grateful and thankful that you've chosen to be with us. Um, we miss being together. We miss assembling together. Um, but we know that right now uh, we're grateful for the, this, we're thankful for the technology that we have to be able to connect in this way. And so thank you for being with us. Um, I'm grateful for the trust that you place in us um, to study with us and worship with us and sing and commune with us um, together. So let's, let's bow and ask God to bless our time, and then we will jump in and we'll study uh, together. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful for the opportunity that we have to study from your word. We're grateful for the study that we have engaged in over the last several weeks in Peter. I'm, I'm thankful for Peter. I'm thankful for his story and his words and for the authority that he has in sharing his own failure with us and his own growth opportunity. I pray that you would bless our time together. Um, I pray that, that we would learn Father, on a day like today, we are particularly grateful for our moms. We're thankful for our mothers and grandmothers, for the godly women who have helped us know you. So many of us have those women in our life, and we hold them up to you as demonstrations of our own gratefulness and thankfulness for what they've done. We pray blessing in their lives and blessing for them. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. And when you hear the word uh, desire, what starts to fire off in your mind? What do you hear? What do you think? What do you see when you hear that word desire? I've got a two-year-old son named John David. Um, it, it's so interesting to see the differences in your children. You've got a nine-year-old, a five-year-old, and a two-year-old. And John David is very different from the other boys. Um, all of us are living in new routines right now. And so we're experiencing things differently uh, in so many ways uh, over the last several weeks. We were outside with some family the other day. Uh, sitting outside and just talking. And John David, uh, when he gets going, it's like release the Kraken, right? I mean, he's full on. He, he goes. And he went and he found a stick that was bigger than he was. And he started bringing it over and waving it around in front of everybody as we were sitting in a circle uh, talking as a family. And he went up to my five-year-old and he said, Silas, I'm going to hit you with this stick. Well, being, you know, the father of the year that I am, I kind of jumped in the middle and I said, John David, you're not going to hit Silas with a stick. And he said, I am going to hit Silas with a stick. So I got down on his level, right? And I said, listen, you are not going to hit John David with the stick. And he, he got the message. So he drops the stick and his facial expression starts to change. He becomes very sad. And his response to me wasn't what I thought it would be. He said, I need to hit Silas with the stick. I need to. And I said, John David, you need to hit Silas with the stick? And he said, I need to hit Silas with the stick. We got some interesting needs sometimes, don't we? At different points in my life with everything in me, I needed a bowl cut, right? When I was a kid, that's what I needed. I needed that kind of hair style. Now, if you're older than me, you might not understand that, but that's what I needed. At one point or another in my life, I needed a, a flannel shirt that matched the starter jacket that I wore to school, right? I needed it. 
or an incredibly colorful windbreaker. That's what I needed. You think about your own life, if you're older or younger than I am, what did you need at one point or another? Here's a truth that might surprise you, or at least it's going to surprise some of us. God created desire. At different points in history, uh, some Christian teachers and theologians tried to prove the fact that desire, like need in and of itself, was not from God. But that's not true. God created need. Now, we certainly confuse it, but God created desire. He didn't necessarily create the need for a starter jacket. Maybe he did. I don't know. But he created desire. The feeling that you have on the inside of you when you need the right thing is from God himself. The psalmist says in the 37th Psalm, delight yourself in the Lord and he'll give you the desires of your heart. When you are delighting yourself in the Lord and that shapes your desires, he's going to give you those desires. Proverbs 10 says the desires of the righteous will be granted. Desire, right? On a certain level, when it is right and good and proper and of the Lord, that's what God created us to feel. Look at what Peter says as we start what we call the second chapter. So put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk that by it you may grow up into salvation if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. Peter says, put away all the perishable things. If you connect this back to the previous chapter, there's a perishable part of life. There are emotions and actions and relationships that are perishable. Put away all of that. Do not be characterized by the old ways. Paul says throughout his writings, take off the old man and put on the new man. In other words, choose to grow. Choose to let God transform who you are. Don't be characterized by the world since you've tasted the goodness of the Lord. That's how that last section of text could read. Since, because you've tasted the goodness of the Lord, because you've experienced the kindness of the Lord, put away all that stuff. Put, walk in that. Put on the new man. There are a couple of movements in this text that I want to, to draw out for us today. And, and, and here's the first one. Put away and grow up. It kind of bookends these verses that we just read. Put away and grow up. Put away all malice and all deceit and all hypocrisy and envy and slander and grow up into salvation. One of the greatest truths that believers in Jesus, disciples of Christ, have at their disposal is that things do not have to stay the same. Things can change. You see, the, the enemy of our souls wants us to believe that the failures of the past or the failures of the present dictate who we will be in the future. What I struggle with today is always going to be what I struggle with. And we believe that lie to the point and enough that we just assume this is who I am. And this is who I'm always going to be. 
I struggled with that in the past. I'm struggling with this in the present. So I'm always going to have to struggle with this same thing on this same level. Right on the surface of this text, if what Peter says is true, is true, and we believe that it is, there is hope for change, for growth. Put off and grow up. Put away and grow up. If we have the choice to put off (laughs) or put away and grow up into salvation, if we have the choice to long and crave, then that means we can grow. One of my favorite stories from church history is about a guy, a theologian, from long ago named Augustine or Augustine. Augustine, before he met Jesus, was widely known to spend his days and nights doing things that he should not be doing. He says of himself that I lived in such debauchery that it would make the worst of the worst blush. Then he met Jesus. And as he continued to meet Jesus, as he continued to walk with Jesus, he transformed, he was transformed. His ways changed, his thinking changed, his disposition changed. He was transformed into something new. One day Augustine or Augustine was walking around the streets of his city and there was a woman who knew the kind of life that he used to live who shouted out at the top of her lungs, Augustine, Augustine, it's me. Don't you remember me? Don't you remember everything? Don't you remember what we experienced together? And Augustine just kept walking. He didn't turn around. So she shouted even louder, Augustine, Augustine, it's me. Don't you remember? It's me. This went on time or two more, until finally Augustine stopped, he turned around, and he said, yes, I know it's you, but it's no longer me. Augustine understood this truth, that things change. It's a lie that we are so susceptible to that what we experience now or what we experience in the past is going to dictate where we go in the future, that we'll never be able to get ahead, that we'll never measure up, that because we experience that, that somehow that means this in the future. Nothing's further from the truth. We recover by the power of Jesus Christ. We heal through the blood of Jesus Christ. We are born again to an imperishable seed and slander can be put off and hate can be put off and manipulation can be put off and we become something new. Augustine knew it. And the reason he knew it is because Peter knew it. There is victory ahead. Put off and grow up. And there's a second movement in these verses. Long or crave or desire. When the Word defines your needs, you become more like Christ, which means, again, you grow. You don't have to be stuck where you're at. You grow up into salvation because you long for spiritual milk that comes from the kindness of God and the Word of God. We long We crave. Let me ask you a question. 
in the first century for the original audience that Peter is writing to, uh, that Peter's got in mind when these words flow out by inspiration of the Spirit himself, what do you think Peter is trying to accomplish in their lives? If the picture that Peter is painting in these couple of verses essentially say, you can grow, you can change, and the power for that change is based on you longing for the kindness of God and longing and desiring for the goodness of God and the Word of God, what does he want to accomplish? Here's what I want you to see today. Growing up, longing for spiritual milk the way that an infant would long for milk wasn't about their personal devotional life. <laughs> I don't want to minimize that because I love it. That's how I commune with God. But what Peter was trying to accomplish for them wasn't so that they would have a better opportunity to sit and journal with their Bibles over coffee early in the morning or late at night. Again, I don't want to minimize that. There is power there. That's not what Peter has in mind when he writes these words. What Peter has in mind, what Peter is suggesting for these believers in exile would benefit their relationships, not only with the world, but their relationships with one another. Now, maybe you say, how in the world do you know that? Look at what Peter said, put away all malice and deceit and hypocrisy and envy and slander. And if a person put away all of that, and then therefore grew up into their salvation, who would receive the benefit of that? Everybody around them. There would be some personal benefit, certainly. But it would benefit their relationships if they put away all of that if they longed for more of the Lord, if they desired more of the Lord, it would benefit those around them. There's no doubt that this kind of lifestyle has an evangelistic aim and an evangelistic thrust. Live this way so that outsiders see that you live this way and wonder what your hope is rooted in and based on why you live this way. There's no doubt that evangelism is in view through this kind of lifestyle, but that's not the only thing going on. There's also no doubt that Peter understands that in exile, out of exile, but particularly in exile, believers needed to treat one another this way because they needed one another to endure the exile that they were living in. The benefit of love, the benefit of being straightforward, the benefit of consistency, the benefit of integrity is for the individual, but it's also for their brothers and sisters in Christ. And it's also for non-believers. Represent Jesus well with outsiders, but represent Jesus well with those that you worship with, that you sit around the table with. Represent him well. In the midst of exile, as the world is beating down your neck, as some of your own members are being punished and executed, as you find yourself in places you never thought you would be with people that you never thought you would see, you are going to need one another. Lean into that not away from it. Don't program your lives in such a way where you are cut off, even in exile. Lean into one another with integrity and love and acceptance and honesty, forgiveness, grace. Let me tell you how exile, I think, 
can affect churches, workplaces, family units even in the 21st century because it's, it's not the exact same thing for us that it was for them, but, but it certainly is rooted in the same place. It's easy for exile in any period of history to cause two things, misunderstanding and miscommunication. I think you know what I mean. Misunderstanding and miscommunication. You see, when our world changes so drastically, so quickly, we all cope with it differently. We deal with things differently. And the way that we deal with things can create misunderstanding. I think that's certainly in view from a first century context, and I know it's true in a 21st century context. You, you, ever, tried, uh, you ever tried to have a lengthy text, a lengthy text, you ever tried to have a conversation over a lengthy text? Do you ever assume that the other party has a positive tone? Rarely, right? If you're in the middle of a conversation via text message, we always misunderstand because we're cut off. We're separate. And exile causes us to react to things that we don't like differently to the point where the way we react is the right way and the way they react is the wrong way. Peter says, put off the old stuff. Put off the, imper- put off the perishable and put on the imperishable. Long for the pure spiritual milk for the Word. Grow up into salvation. I don't think this is just for one person. This is for the community. This is for the network of churches in the whole area. Grow up into salvation together. You see, relational dynamics change when people enter into periods of time that we're in. Here's what I know. The last two months have been terribly difficult for so many people on so many different levels. And over and over and over again, the message that the Lord has revealed to me, the demonstration of the Lord in my own life has been the power of God's people. A group of people who have grown up into salvation together because they have put away hypocrisy, because they have put away manipulation. Misunderstanding and miscommunication are real things in these times. And Peter says, I think, to everybody, grow up together. Hold on together because these periods of time force us to need one another. Lean in to one another. There's power there. There's power in a group of people saying, I'm going to grow with you and you're going to grow with me. There's power in saying, I'm going to... I know that in this time, it's easy for me to misunderstand. It's easy for me to miscommunicate. I'm going to put away all of the fleshly stuff that I want to put away, and I'm going to put on what the Word guides me to put on. My, My prayer for all of us is that we would understand that we need each other. And I want you to know, right where you're at, no matter where you're from, no matter what your background is, that you need the church. We would love for it to be ours, but you need the church. There's power there. My family and I have talked over the last several days 
uh, as, as we've experienced challenging circumstances and difficulties, how blessed we are to be a part of the church that we are a part of. That we believe with all of our heart over all of the experiences over the last two months, and exile is one of those big ones <laughs> in our own right. It's different than the first century, but in our own right. That we believe that God brought us to where we're at so that we could experience what we've experienced and the care and the concern and the encouragement. If you don't have that, I'm praying for you. And I would challenge you to find that, to experience that, because once you do, you'll be urged to grow up even more. Let's pray together. God, I'm grateful for this text. I'm thankful for who you are. Pray your blessing on our church body. Pray your blessing on everybody that's watching and the churches that they are a part of. Father, I pray that we would grow up together, rooted in your word, put away what you ask us to put away. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Be blessed.